Hi, my name is Connor, and you're very welcome to today's Saturday session, which is going to cover leave insert biology. And the topic for today is genetics. So throughout today's video, we're going to be looking at all of the theory associated with genetics, and we're going to really dive into the genetic crosses. So both looking at the monohybrid and the dihybrid crosses, and then also looking at incomplete dominance and sex linkage. And throughout the video and throughout this course today, we're also going to look at a number of different exam questions, just so we know the style of question that comes up to make sure that we're fully prepared for the exam next year. Now, before we get into all of that, we're going to have a look at a little bit of background information around variation. So when we talk about the idea of a species, you might have heard of that before. A species is a group of similar organisms that can breathe with each other to produce fertile offspring. OK, so that's really, really important there that it has to be fertile offspring. So if you think of specific examples, maybe of a dog, they're similar species. They can breathe with each other to produce fertile offspring. But if you look at maybe a donkey and a horse, they're different species. So if they were to breed, they can produce offspring, but the offspring are not going to be fertile. OK, they're different species. So we all belong to the same human species. But if you look around the room, maybe it's your classroom or maybe at home, you will see lots of differences in height, your hair color, your eye color and so on. So this variation that you can see is caused by two things. It can be caused by the environment and it can also be caused by inheritance, which is controlled by genes. And it's that inheritance and in genes that we're really going to be focusing in on today. So when we mention genetics, genetics is the study of how characteristics are passed on from one generation to another. The idea of heredity then is the passing on of features to offspring. So you might look at your parents, you might have similar features to them. That all comes back to heredity. Now, any characteristics which are passed on from parents to their offspring, they're known as inherited characteristics, and they would include things such as hair color and eye color, and then acquired characteristics are those that are not inherited from our parents and instead those are learned throughout life. So maybe your ability to play a musical instrument, your ability to play a sport, all of those will be acquired characteristics. Now for when we get into our genetic crosses in the next couple of minutes, it's really important that we know nucleus, chromosomes and genes. So the chromosomes are the thread-like structures which are found in the nucleus of an animal or a plant cell. Okay, so we can see over here we have our nucleus, our chromosomes are these thread-like structures which we find, find inside. We have 23 pairs as humans of those inside the nucleus. And on those chromosomes, this is where we find our genes. Okay, so they're the bands that go across. It's actually a little bit better to see it in the diagram down here. So all of these individual dark bands that you see going, going across, they're the genes and they're what controls the characteristics that pass on from parents to their offspring. So that's what it says over here. A gene is a short section of DNA in a chromosome which codes for a protein. OK, the way in which it makes and expresses the protein is called gene expression. So that's how it physically manifests itself in the offspring. Humans, as we said, then will have 46 chromosomes in each cell. So they will have 23 pairs. One of those pairs are the sex chromosomes. So this last pair down here will control whether the offspring is male or female. All of the other ones will code for other proteins and will determine other characteristics. OK, and it's the genes that are located on the chromosomes that will do that for us. Now, where do these um, chromosomes actually come from? Well, during reproduction, the male sperm and the female egg will fuse to form a zygote. So the sperm is going to carry 23. So if we think of an existing cell normally having 46, the sperm and the egg, so that will undergo um, cell division known as meiosis. That will give us four daughter cells, each one having half the number of chromosomes as the original parent cell or the mother cell. So each one is going to have 23. So meiosis is a particular form of cell division, which specifically involves the sex cells. We start off with 46 chromosomes. We end up with half the number. So it's now going to become haploid. So we have 23. So the sperm is going to have 23. The egg is going to divide in a similar way. So they're also going to have 23. And they're going to combine together or fuse together to form a zygote. So 23 and 23 is going to give us 46. So it's a full complement there. It has two copies, diploid but it's going to be a little bit of variation from both of the parents because we've some of those coming from the father, some of them coming from the mother. So this new zygote has a unique combination of genes inherited from both the mother and the father. So that's coming back to the idea a couple of minutes ago about how we can see variation. Some of these genes are coming from our parents or from our mother. Some of them are coming from our father. So that's why we can see variation in the offspring. Now, we've already mentioned some of this already. So we've mentioned how during reproduction, the male sperm and the female egg will fuse to form a zygote. 
23 chromosomes from the sperm, 23 chromosomes from the egg, which would give the zygote 46. But there's going to be some variation there in the offspring because we're not getting them all from one parent. We're getting some from one parent and the rest from another parent, half and half. That's going to lead to variation. Now, the genes on these chromosomes are going to encode for proteins. And the same can have different forms, and this is called an allele. So each gene can have a different form. So if you think of your eye colour, you're not just going to have everybody with the same eye colour. You'll have a gene that controls eye colour. One of those could be brown, one could, one could be blue. Okay, we're going to have different variations of the same gene. So that's an allele, and we're going to be focusing in on those in the next couple of minutes. So we've mentioned this already. The new zygote is going to have a unique combination of genes inherited from both the mother and the father. And we can see that down here in the chromosomes. So here's one chromosome. Here's the corresponding chromosome. This is our gene. So that's the gene. This here, this is one variation. That's the allele for purple flowers. So this particular gene is going to encode for, for color or for flower color. This variation codes for purple. This one here codes for white. Okay. It's the same location. It's a gene that's encoding for flower color. This allele or this variation is for purple. This allele or this variation is for white. So the specific gene can have different variations and this is known as an allele. Now, before we start to have a look at our genetic crosses, one of the last things we need to know kind of as background information is the idea of dominant and recessive genes. So sometimes one gene for a trait is going to be dominant over another gene for the exact same trait. The non-dominant gene is going to be known as the recessive gene. So a dominant trait will show in a child even if only one parent has the dominant trait. But a recessive gene will only show if both parents pass on that recessive gene to the child. So you're going to get one pass from your father, you're going to get one pass from your mother. And we can see that over here in what we call Punnett square. So here's one parent, we could say that's just parent number one. Don't know if it's the mother or the father, we'll just call it parent one. And parent two is here at the side. So parent number one has two copies of the gene. One of them is for brown, one of them is for blue. Parent two also has two copies, one for brown, one for blue. Now the reason both parents end up with brown eyes is because brown is dominant over blue. The only way that a blue eye would appear here is if we also had a small b over here for small blue, then it will be expressed. But because brown is dominant, it's going to be expressed over the blue. So this Punnett square is basically going to lay out all of the different combinations we can have from our parents. So parent number one can pass on the brown. Parent number two can also pass on the brown allele. So if that happens, we have two capital Bs. So the reason we use capital Bs is because it's dominant. Two capital Bs, which means that child there would have brown eyes. Parent number one could pass off the brown allele. Parent number two could pass off the blue allele. The brown is going to win out, so that child has brown eyes. Over here, if parent number one passed on the blue allele, and parent number two passed on the brown allele, again, the brown is going to win out, so the child is going to have brown eyes. But if parent number one passed on the blue allele, and parent number two passed on the blue allele, then the child is going to have blue. The only way that that's going to happen there is because both of the alleles are recessive, and we need both of those to exist, or both of those to occur, for the recessive trait to show. And that's exactly what's happening down here in this box of the Punnett square. So, one of the examples there we have of dominant recessive traits is the idea of eye colour, which we've just seen. So the gene has two versions. The dominant version is represented by a capital B, so we use capital for a dominant, and the recessive is little b, causes blue eyes. So for anything recessive, we use a small letter and not a capital letter. So one of the last things then, the physical expression, so what actually is physically expressed in the offspring, that's known as the phenotype, whereas the genotype is the genetic makeup. So if we look at the table over here on the right hand side, this here is all of the genotypes. Okay, that's the genetic makeup. We have two capital Bs, so two alleles for, for brown. We have a capital B and a small b. Just good notation there, always put the capital letter first if there is one. That again is a genotype. That child is going to have brown eyes, which is the phenotype over here. And this genotype is two small b's, and we know because there's two recessive versions there, that child is going to have blue eyes. So all of these here are the genotypes. And over here, these are our phenotypes. So where did all of this come from and who was the person responsible for our study of this today? 
while Gregor Mendel was Czech monk who used peas and breathing experiments in the late 1850s and 1860s. So he studied the inheritance of different characteristics in pea plants, and he found that when he bred red flowered plants with white flower plants, all of the offspring produced red flowers. But then he also noticed that if he bred the red flower plants with each other, most of the offspring had red flowers, but some had white. So this had led him to the idea that the allele for red flowers was dominant and the allele for white flowers was recessive. And then he started to do that on more peas. So he started conducting the exact same um, experiment on green pods and yellow pods and pretty much found out the exact same thing. So it was the whole idea of a trait either being dominant or being recessive. So he came up with two laws in his time of studying genetics and one of them was Mendel's law of segregation. So Mendel's law of segrega segregation states that a diploid organism, so if you have two copies of chromosomes, a diploid organism will pass a randomly selected allele for a trait to its offspring. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, if you have one parent over here, they're going to have two copies. So they have a capital G and a capital G. They're only going to pass one of those on to the offspring. And it's completely random as to which one it is. Exact same over here for parent number two, where they have two small g's. It's completely random as to which one is going to be passed off, but one of them is going to be passed. So Mendel's law of segregation states that a diploid organism, so two copies, that's why they're diploid, a diploid organism passes a randomly selected allele for a trait to its offspring. So completely random, which of these alleles is going to be passed off to the offspring. So that's his law of segregation. We're now going to start to illustrate genetic crosses with the use of Punnett squares. So a Punnett square is just a simple idea that's used to show genetic crosses. Now, when I'm teaching my students, I always get them to lay them out the exact same way as here. So I have five little subheadings, which we can see. I have the parents, I have the gametes, I have the Punnett square, I have the genotype, and I have the phenotype. You might lay that out slightly different depending on what way your teacher showed you, but it's going to be the exact same idea. Okay, the layout of it doesn't fully matter. Once you are able to show the genetic cross, that's the main thing. If you want to start using it this way, that's absolutely fine as well. So our question here says, show the pattern in eye color of a family where one parent is capital B, capital B, and the second is small b, small b. So I'm just gonna write a little note up here. I know that capital B is brown and small b is blue. So one parent is capital B, capital B, the other is small b, small b. So we have to cross that. Now Mendel's law of segregation says it's completely random as to which allele is going to be passed off. So parent number one can pass off this capital B or they can pass off this capital B. It doesn't matter, completely random. Parent number two, we have a small b and we have a small b. So again, doesn't matter. Now our Punnett square, we have two options here. We have two options here, which means we're gonna have two rows and two columns in our table quick Punnett square here. Parent number one can go along the top, parent number two along the side, and now we just match them. <clears throat> so we have a capital B and a small b. We have the exact same over here. So we had a capital B and a small b. Here we have a capital B and a small b. And down here we have a capital B and a small b. So what is our genotype? Well, our genotype is we have four of the exact same, which means our physical expression or our phenotype is going to be four brown eyes. So there's a 100% chance that the offspring is going to have brown eyes in this particular case. So again, you might lay yours out slightly differently, depending on what way you were shown in class. But if you want to start using it this way, that's absolutely fine as well. Once you have the main idea down here, that's the most important thing. And you should be able to list your genotype and your phenotype. That's usually where the questions are going to be asked from. So our second example here, show the pattern in eye color of a family where one parent is capital B, small b, and the second has blue eyes. So again, just remember our note, capital B was brown, small b was the allele for blue. So one parent is capital B, small b, and the other has blue eyes. Now we know blue is recessive, so the only way that can happen is if the second parent had two copies of the recessive allele, which is small b, small b. So this first parent can pass on a capital B allele, brown allele, or the small b, okay, the blue allele. There's only one option for the second parent, but we're just gonna put down both of them there anyway, 
it has to pass on a small b. Okay, it has to pass on the blue allele because it's recessive. It has two copies of that. So again, we're going to have two rows, two columns. Parent number one along the top. You could put that one along the side if you wanted to, and then put this one along the top. It actually doesn't matter. You get the exact same answer. I'm just going to lay it out like that. And now we do some matching. So this first box here, capital B, small b. This one over here, two small b's. This one down here, a capital B and a small b. And the last one is also two small b's. So if we were to list out all of our genotypes now, we have two copies of a capital B and a small b, and we have two copies of two small b's. So we have two brown. The reason we have brown is the dominant version here, the brown is gonna win out over the blue, so we have two brown. And in these two down here, we have two small b's, which means the recessive version is going to win out. So we have two blue. Okay, so a 50-50 chance of brown and blue in this particular case. Now, at this point, we're going to introduce two more keywords. We're going to introduce the idea of homozygous and heterozygous. So in each of those examples, each parent either had the same alleles or they had different alleles. Now, for same alleles, the examples we would have seen for that was two capital B's. Or two small b's we have the same alleles two identical copies but for different we would have had a capital b and a small b okay so rather than use the word same and different homo means same we're going to use homozygous or homozygous and for different we're going to use heterozygous Okay, so if you see homozygous, it means that we have the same copy or the same alleles. Heterozygous is different alleles. And we can see that down here as well in the diagram. So if we look at our chromosomes here, this is an example of a homozygous set of chromosomes because we have the same allele that's present. This also is homozygous because we have the same allele that's present. Over here, this is heterozygous because if we look at our pair of chromosomes, we have different alleles present in the same location. Okay, so we're going to keep that in mind now for the next couple of examples where the words homozygous and heterozygous could be used. So this particular example says, show the pattern in eye colour of a family where both parents have brown eyes. So in this case, they're heterozygous. So parent number one crossed with parent number two. They're both the exact same. Now the gametes that can be passed on, parent number one can do a capital B or a small b. Parent number two is the exact same. So we'll form our Punnett square, two by two grid. Again, doesn't matter which parent goes where. And if we quickly do our genetic cross here, we can see that we have lots of different options here. So we have one of two capital Bs. We have two of a capital B and a small b. And we have one of two small Bs. Now, if we move that over to our phenotype, this one is definitely having brown. These two are also having brown because the dominant version here is going to win out over the recessive version, which is blue. But this one here is going to be blue. So we actually have three brown and one blue. Okay, so that was an example there where both parents were heterozygous. All right, we're gonna have a look at an exam question then which came up. So this came up a couple of years ago. So it says, in squirrels, the allele for black coat colour, which is B, capital B, is dominant to the allele for a grey coat colour, which is a small b. A heterozygous black squirrel is crossed with a grey squirrel. Complete the blank spaces below to show the genotypes and phenotypes of the cross. So let's just have a quick look. So it said that a heterozygous black squirrel, so that's this one here. It's heterozygous because we have two different copies, different copies, a capital B and a small b. And we were also told it was black, which makes sense because we were told that black was dominant, so that's going to win out. This one here is going to be grey. It's also homozygous, because the only way that grey can be um, expressed is if we have two versions of the recessive allele, which is exactly what we have here, and we have the same allele, so it's homozygous. So what gametes can be possible over here? Well, we can have a capital B, or we can have a small b. Over here, there's only one possible gamete that can be passed on. That's a small b. doesn't matter which one you take, it's still going to be a small b. So I'm going to actually do the, um, the Punnett square down underneath, just so I have a little bit more room. So 
So we have a capital B and a small b, and we have a small b here at the side. So we can have a capital B and a small b, or we can have two small b's. So capital B, small b, two small b's. So this one over here is going to be the same as that first parent, so that's going to be black. This one over here is going to be grey. Okay, so we actually end up with offspring that are the same, 50-50 chance we have black and we also have grey. So a nice simple exam question that's come up using the knowledge that we've picked up already. Now we're going to have a little look here at sex determination, which can also be dictated using the Punnett square. So we've mentioned this already, but each human has 23 pairs of chromosomes, and one of these pairs is the sex chromosomes. Okay, so with the 23rd pair, the variations we have are X and we have Y. So if you have an X and a Y, then that's going to be male offspring. If you have X and X, it's going to be female. Okay, so males are XY, females are XX. As the male contains the only different chromosome, they determine the sex of the child. Okay, because once that Y is present, that means the offspring has to be male. Okay, so it's the male that determines the sex of the child. How does this actually make sense? Well, if we form a little Punnett square over here, Parent number one, which is the male, is going to be XY. Parent number two, which is the female, is going to be XX. So I'm only going to look at the left-hand side of the Punnett square for now. And in both of those cases, we're going to have XX and we're going to have XX. Okay, so both of those are female. Now that's only if the male passes off the X chromosome. Okay, that was how we will end up with all female offspring. But the minute a Y is introduced, these two over here are going to be male. So because it's the male that passes off the male chromosome, it's the male that determines the sex of the child. Now up until this point, we've looked at situations where there was always one allele that was dominant over another. That's not always going to be the case. Sometimes there will be situations where neither allele is dominant over the other, and this is called either incomplete or co-dominance. Okay, neither one is um, dominant over the other, so it's incomplete dominance, or they're co-dominant, there's co-dominance. So this generally will occur in shorthorn cattle and the colour of flowers in snapdragons. And we can see that over here in the diagram. So we have a capital or is red, and a small or is going to be white. Now, up until this point, if we had a heterozygous um, combination there, where we had capital or and small or, we would think that the red would win out, but in this case, it's actually going to be pink. Okay, we're going to have an intermediate there, it's going to be pink. So the two variations, or the two, depending on which two alleles are present, that's going to control the flower colour. If there's two capital ores, it's going to be red. If it's going to be two small ores, it's going to be white. And if you have the intermediate there, which is one of each, it's going to form pink. And we'll see a couple of examples of that now in the next couple of minutes. So, example here, flower colour in snapdragon shows co-dominance. Red flowers are capital or capital or, white are small or small or, and pink are capital or small or, so that's the intermediate. Show the results of crossing two pink flowers. So if we have two pink flowers as parents, we have to have capital or small or crossed with capital or small or. The exact same idea from now. We have a capital or, or a small or, a capital or, or a small or. So we have former Punnett square, two by two table and we just fill in the blanks so we have a capital or capital or capital or small or capital or small or and two small ors so we have one two capital ors two of a capital or and a small or and one two small ors so what does that mean for a phenotype well the capital or is going to be red we have two pink, because if you have a capital or and a small or, which is what we have here, we know that that's pink. And if we have two small ors, that's going to be white. So we have one white as well. Now, if you want, you can convert those to percentages as well. So that would be 25%, 50%, and 25%. Sometimes you will be asked for the percentages, not all of the time. So it's completely up to you what way you want to do it. You could also do it as a ratio if you wanted to. You could do one is to two is to one. Again, completely up to you. So let's have a look at an exam question here then. 
So in Andalusian chickens, the allele for black feathers, which is capital B, exhibits incomplete dominance or co-dominance over the allele for white flowers, which is small b. When a black homozygous rooster, which is male, is crossed with a white homozygous hen, which is female, all the newly hatched chicks will have an intermediate phenotype of speckled colour, capital B, small b, known as blue. So we have to explain the underlined terms. So the first underlined term we have there is the allele. And we know this is just a variation or a version of a gene. Okay, so the variation of a gene. The second one we had there was incomplete dominance. This occurs when no one allele is dominant over another. And we could say an intermediate phenotype is expressed. So a slightly longer answer there, but that was incomplete dominance. We also had homozygous. So we have two copies of an allele. Or you could say identical or same alleles. You could even throw in a little example there if you wanted to, just by putting capital B, capital B, just to show that you really know what you're talking about. And phenotype, that's the physical expression of a gene. Okay, so that was all our definitions. Now the second part, I'm going to have to do this up at the top just so I don't run out of space. It says, determine all the possible genotypes and phenotypes of the offspring um, of a cross between the following chickens. So we have a blue rooster and a blue hen. So if something is going to be blue, I'm just going to lay this out like I did before. So we have our parents, gametes, and we'll have our Punnett square and our phenotype and our genotypes down there as well. Okay. So parents were capital B, small b. So these are possible gametes. Former Punnett square really quickly there. And we just fill in the blanks. So our genotypes, we have one of two capital Bs, two of a capital B and a small b, and one of two small Bs. Okay, so if we were to fill in the phenotypes, the different options we have there, sorry, I should have just done that underneath, I'll write that in above, we have one black, two blue, and I'll just do one by W for one by white. Okay, where does that come from? Well, that one there has to be black because it has two copies of the black. This one here has one copy of each, so that has to be blue, that's the intermediate. And this one here has two copies of white, so that one is going to be white. So that was the Punnett square. It says here though, just read, include in your answer the ratio of the resulting phenotypes. So I'm gonna to have to do that underneath. It's going to be one black is to two blue is to one white. Okay, so just make sure I'm putting the ratio there because it did specifically ask for it. And then part three, again, I'm going to run out of room, so I'll just try and squish this in at the side. So it says, um, what would be the effect on the offspring phenotype ratio in the genetic cross if there was no incomplete dominance between the two alleles and if the black feather was dominant to white? Well, in that case there, if this is the only one that's going to change, this one has to be black, this one has to stay white, this one, instead of being blue, they're just going to become black because the capital B is going to win out, capital B is black. So the ratio is going to change to three black is to one white, okay? So three black is to one white. So there's gonna be no blue, but they will switch over to black because the capital B is going to win out. Okay, so hair color in short term cows shows co-dominance. Red hair is capital or capital or, white is small or small or, and rowan, which have both hair colors, are capital or small or. Show the results of crossing um, a rowan cow with a red bull. So the first parent is capital or small or, Second one is two capital ORs, so our gametes are going to be as such. Former Punnett square. Sorry, 
right, it's not a B, it should be an or. And we will get these combinations. So what do we have? We have two copies of two capital ORs, and we have two of a capital OR and a small OR. So that means we would have two red. This one here is going to be red. This one here is the intermediate, which is going to be Rowan in this case. Okay, so once again, just showing an example of co-dominance or incomplete dominance. Now, up until this point, we've been looking at crosses where we've only had one trait being looked at at the same time. Okay, so we're only looking at one or a single characteristic. Dihybrid crosses involve looking at two characteristics at the same time. So Mendel's law of independent assortment states that the alleles of two or more different genes get sorted into gametes independently of each other. So it means that you can look at two separate traits because one is not going to have an impact on the other. So now we're going to have a look at an example of what's known as a dihybrid cross. Okay, we're looking at two characteristics, di. We're looking at two characteristics at the same time. So in Guinea, black coat, capital B, is dominant to white coat, which is small b. Up until this point, that's all of the information we would have had. But now we've something else introduced. So we're also told that short hair is dominant, so capital S, to long hair, which is a small s. A heterozygous, black-coated, short-haired guinea is crossed with a white-coated, long-haired guinea. So there's a lot of information there to dissect. So we're going to look at parent number one first of all, and we're going to look at their coat. Okay, I'm going to highlight this in two different colours. So parent number one, they're heterozygous, that means different versions, and they're black-coated and short-haired. Okay, black-coated and short-haired. So if they have black coat and they're heterozygous, they're going to have a capital B and a small b. They're heterozygous. But they're also heterozygous for length and they're short-haired. Okay, so they're heterozygous, so they're going to have a capital S and a small s. So that there is parent number one. Up until this point, we would have had a look at just these two or these two, but now we have four different things here. That's going to be crossed with a second parent and they're white-coated and long-haired. The only way white coat can come up is if we have two copies of the small b. So they have to be small b, small b to start off with. And they're also long haired. Again, long hair is recessive. So the only way that can come up is if we have two small s's. So our gametes in this case, we're going to have one passed on for hair color. We're going to have one passed on for our hair length. Okay, so we have to see what different combinations are possible here. But one different um, or one possible outcome that we have here is to have the capital B and the capital S. Another option is to have the capital B and the small s. Another option is to have the small B and the small s. Or another option is to have the small B and the small s. OK, so we have four different possibilities for that one parent, trying to see what combination of the B's and S's that we have. Now, when we move over to parent number two, this one's actually quite straightforward. There's only one possible combination that can come up here, and that's to have a small b and a small s. So if we form our Punnett square, we're going to have one row, and we'll have four columns. So we have capital B, capital S, capital B, small s, small b, capital S, small b, small s. And just be careful that you really make sure which ones are, for s's in particular, which one of the capital, which one is small, because it can become quite confusing. And then over at the side, we're going to have a small b and a small s. So now we match them all up. Try and have it um, with the capital letters first, if there is capital letters. So the two copies of the b and then the two copies of the s. So we have a capital B, small b, capital S, small s. Capital B, small b, two small s's, two small b's, a capital S and a small s two small b's and two small s's. Now, your genotypes are going to stay the exact same. I'm not going to list all of them out because that will take too long, but you would just list them here as normal. Now, your phenotypes, this one here, the capital B and the capital S is going to win out, so it's going to be black and short. So I'll just write it underneath first of all, so black and short. The second one is going to be black and long. This one is going to be white and short, and this one is going to be white and long. So once I have that information there, I can write it over here. So we'll have one black and short, one black and long. Again, you write out full words. I'm just going to do this to speed it up. 
one by white and short and one by white and long. Okay, so we have one of each in that particular dihybrid cross. So in this one, in P's tall plants, capital T is dominant over short, which is small t. Green colouring, capital G, is dominant over yellow colouring, which is small g. A homozygous tall green plant is crossed with a small yellow plant. So homozygous being the keyword there, which means we're going to have the same copies. So the first parent is tall and green, again having the same copies. So we have TT, GG. And then the other one is small and yellow. Only way that can happen is if the recessive genes are there. And we have to have two copies of each. So it's going to be crossed with small t, small t, small g, small g. So what's the particular gametes that we have in this case? Well, there's only one possible option for each. There's no other combinations that can come from the parents. So our Punnett square is actually going to be very short in this case. And we're going to notice that all of the offspring are going to be the exact same, which is tall and green. So 100% of them are going to be tall and green. So we have another exam question here. We're going to focus in on the second part and the third part. I'm going to leave out that first part there because that's just the definitions which we see in a couple of slides ago. So you can go back for those. But Gregor Mendel studied the inheritance of various traits in pea plants. The results of some of his investigations are presented in the table. So when round and wrinkled seeds were crossed, they all ended up round. When yellow and green seeds were crossed, they all ended up yellow. When purple and white um, flowers were crossed, they all ended up purple. And when tall and dwarf plants were crossed, they all ended up tall. So we're going to skip down to the second part there, which says a dwarf pea plant with green seeds was crossed with a plant heterozygous for both height and seed colour. Indicate by means of a genetic cross the possible genotypes and phenotypes of the progeny of this cross, if there is no linkage of the genes. So we just lay that out as normal. So we have our parents, gametes, our Punnett square, our genotype, first of all, and our phenotype. Okay, so what's it saying here? So it says that a dwarf pea plant for with green seeds. So if we have a look up here at the table, we can see that yellow is definitely dominant because yellow is winning out. Okay, so we're going to do capital G for yellow. You can do Y if you want, we'll actually go with Y. So capital Y is yellow and small y is green. And what else do we need? So we need whether it's tall or short. So we know that if tall plants were crossed with dwarf plants, all of them are going to be tall. So T, capital T is going to be tall. Small t is going to be short. So what are we told? A dwarf pea plant. So that one, if it's going to be dwarf, it has to have two copies of the small t for that to win out with green. So we're also going to have two small y's is crossed with a plant heterozygous. So heterozygous for both. So we're going to have one copy of each. Capital T, small t, capital Y, small y. So we're going to perform that cross now once we have our gametes. So the only possible option we have here is a small t and a small y. Whereas over here, we have a couple of different options. So we have four different options. So we form our Punnett square. Sorry, drew that one wrong. So it should be one row and four columns, or four rows and one column, up to you. Again, just be careful of your Y's so you know which one is which. Okay, so our genotypes, we have capital T, small t, capital Y, small y, capital T, small t, two small y's, two small t's, a capital Y and a small y, and two small t's and two small y's. So our phenotypes, this one here, that's going to be tall and yellow. The second one here is going to be tall and green. The third one is going to be short and yellow.
and I'm actually just going to change that slightly just to use the terminology that they use. I'm actually just going to change that to dwarf. And the last one there is going to be dwarf and green. Okay, so that's the genetic cross done. We can see what the offspring are going to be like. And it says, explain how the results of the cross in two would differ if the genes for height and seed color were linked. Well, what would happen there? We'll just do this over here. If it was linked, well, there's going to be less variation there. And you probably mostly get parental phenotypes. So it just comes straight from the parent. Okay, so we can see that there was lots of variation there compared to what the parents were in the particular question. There'd be less variation and we'll be mostly following the parental phenotypes. So the final thing we're going to look at today is the idea of sex linkage. So sex linkage refers to the fact that the characteristic is controlled by a gene on an X chromosome. There are very few genes on the Y chromosome, so that doesn't control it. And we can see that over here. So we have three X chromosomes here. We can see we've lots of genes there, the dark bands going across, we've lots of genes on each individual one, so they control the characteristic that's passed. The Y has very few genes, so that doesn't control it. So some examples of sex-linked genes or sex-linked conditions will be colour blindness and haemophilia. So the gene for haemophilia is found on the X chromosome. Normal clotting is denoted by capital N. Haemophilia is N is small n as it is recessive. A father who has normal clotting has a child with a carrier mother. Okay. So, we have two parents, we're going to have our male parent, and we're going to have our female parent. We know that, okay, so this is the male, this is the female. Now the X chromosome is the one that carries the gene, so we're going to look first of all at the male parent, and then the female parent. So the father has normal clotting, so if he has normal clotting, that means he has a capital N on the X chromosome. The female is a carrier, so she carries the haemophilia gene, but it's recessive, so it's not going to be expressed. So the capital N is going to win out, but she does carry the small n. So our possible gametes, exact same as before. We'll form our Punnett square. So this one here, x capital N, x capital N, x capital N, y x capital N, x small n, x small n, y. So our genotypes, we have one, we have one of a capital X with a capital N and an X with a small n, one with an X with a capital N and a Y, and one with an X with a small n and a Y. So our phenotypes, if we look at this one here, so it's female and it's going to be normal, so female and normal. This one down here is going to be female and normal. So we can actually change that then to two. This one here is going to be male and normal. But this one here is going to be male and have haemophilia. Okay, so three of the four offspring are going to have normal clotting. Two of them are going to be female, two of them are going to be male. But there would be one male down here which would have haemophilia. So our final exam question for today. So it says, unlike, okay, unlike the situation in humans, maleness in birds results from the presence of the XX chromosome. So two Xs. In, in uh, humans, that would be female, but in birds, it's XX. Um, and the female results from the XY. In a particular bird species, green plumage, capital G, is dominant to yellow plumage, which is small g, and long tail, capital L, is dominant to short tail, which is small l. Um, the gene for plumage colour is linked to the gene for tail length. Study the genotypes of the bird species, and in your answer book, match the correct genotype to each of the descriptions, one to six. A diagram may match more than one of the correct descriptions. So we're looking for a female. Now, if we're looking for a female, again, it's not going to be XX like in humans, we're looking for XY. So it either has to be this one, this one or this one. So it has to be B, D or E. We're ruling out A and C straight away. But we're looking for heterozygous in respect of plumage, colour and tail length. So let's have a look. Can it be this one? 
the answer is no, because they're both homozygous. That's homozygous, two copies of small g, two copies of small l. This one here, they're different, so it's going to be e. A male, so we're looking for a male, so we're looking for xx. So it has to be this one, or it has to be this one. That can produce only one type of gamete. Okay, that has to be this one because they're homozygous. This one here can pass off a capital G or a small G or a capital L or a small L. This is restric restricted to capital G's and small L's. So that's going to be C. The individual that can produce the greatest number of different gametes. So if we're looking for this, we're looking for anyone that has all different, okay, capital G, small G, capital L, small L, X's and Y's. And we can see straight away over there, that's going to be E. A male, all of whose offspring will have long tails. Now, again, let's go back up to the top. Male, we're looking for XX, and we're looking for long tails, which is capital L. So ideally, we're looking for XX and two capital L's, because then it would have to be have to be male. So we're going to look for this one here. So that, again, is going to be C. A female, all of whose offspring will have green plumage. Okay, so again, for female, we're looking for XY and for green plumage, it's dominant, so we're looking for two capital G's. So we're looking for X, Y, and we're looking for two capital G's. So B would do that first there. A male that is homozygous in respect of plumage, color, and tail length. So male, we're looking for X, X. So again, it has to be A or C, but homozygous, we're looking for the same. This one is not the same. We have a capital G and a small g, a capital L and a small l. So it has to be C. And final question, in your answer book, write out the genotypes of the gametes that bird D can produce. So if we look at bird D up here, we can see it has the same copies of the G, same copies of the L's. Okay, so no matter which one we look at, it's still going to be a small G and a small L that's, that's passed off to the offspring. But there is the possibility of passing off an X, or there's the possibility of passing off the Y. Okay, so the small g and the small l is always going to be the same, but it's either going to be an x or a y, it also passes off. So we have two possible um, options there for that one. So that's pretty much it for today's Saturday session. I hope you enjoyed it. And just before we go, I'm just going to show you around the exam revision website. So when you log into exam revision, you'll see that we have a number of different subjects which you can sign up for. So we have leave and biology. We have business, we have chemistry, vac science, economics, English, French, geography, maths, music, physics, and so on. And no matter which one you sign up for, the layout is going to be the exact same. You have video tutorials, you have quizzes, you have presentations, you have an exam builder, and you have a resource pack. Now we're going to look at the resource pack to start off with. So if you wanted the notes from today's session, you'd find genetics, which is in unit two. Scroll down until you see the resource pack genetics. And you'll see that there's a full set of H1 notes which you can use to help you with your study and help you answer some exam questions. Now, if we go back a screen, we'll also see that we have video tutorials on everything to do with genetics. So if you wanted to know a little bit more about the monohybrid crosses, we'll tap on that video. And you can watch a fully worked out um, tutorial video on how to solve monohybrid crosses and all of the terminology associated with those. And it's not just genetics. If we go back over, We can click into any one of the units, we'll pick unit 3, we'll have a look at transport and nutrition, we can see that every single topic that you need for Leave Insert Biology is there. When you've watched all the videos and you're happy with the content, you can press on one of the quizzes, there will be a multiple choice quiz there for you to answer, just for you to test your knowledge, and when you've done all the quizzes, there is also the option of the exam builder as well. So this will be all of the past Leave Insert exam questions and the mock questions, so you can really test your knowledge and make sure you know all of the topics inside out. So if you want to find a little bit more out about the website and everything we have to offer, just go to examrevision.ie and if you scroll right down to the bottom, you'll be able to find a little bit more about the pricing and the subscription models which are available to you. So keep an eye on all of our social media and especially our YouTube channel. We'll be back every Saturday with a new Saturday session for all the Leave and Search, um, all the Leave and Search subjects. I'll have another couple of biology ones lined up for the rest of the year. So I hope to see you again soon.